St. Augustine, uh, one of the great Christian thinkers in history, uh, lived in the 4th century. He died in the 5th century. And among the various achievements of St. Augustine is his uh, deep reflection on uh, faith, on God, the nature of God, the essence of God. Uh, many of his great ideas are at least touched upon in his book called The Confessions. Uh, the Confessions is uh, autobiographical. In the first nine books of that work, Augustine uh, gives a, a kind of sketch of his life beginning from the earliest memories that he had. In fact, even reaching beyond those memories, he thinks some about uh, what he must have been like even as an infant and what his life must have been like in its earliest days. But Augustine is very interested in trying to figure out uh, what it is that that uh, is going on beneath the surface of human thought and of human life. What I'd like to focus in on at present is uh, what I might call Augustine's argument for the existence of God. Really, the, the ex describing this as an argument for God might be a little too strong. Augustine does not think that we need arguments for God. Augustine thinks that the existence of God is as evident to us as the light is in the room that you're sitting in. But it's often something that we don't directly think about or something we don't directly turn our attention to. Uh, once we are directed to maybe pay attention to it or see it or see how God's existence is really a kind of presupposition of all uh, human experience, um, then I think we're in a position to see how Augustine really thinks about God. He doesn't think that we reason to God uh, through a series of arguments that then concludes, oh, there's a God out there somewhere. Uh, no, for Augustine, uh, God is uh, at work in, in the human mind and in the human heart all throughout life at every stage. <clears throat> for example, Augustine would be, I think, very inclined to direct our attention to our experience of wanting to know the truth of things, even when someone disagrees, for instance, with an argument for God's existence, and they say, no, that's not a good argument, or God doesn't exist. They're still approaching the question as if they are able to arrive at a true understanding of reality. Uh, and they have come to the conclusion, for whatever reason, that God doesn't exist. But Augustine would, would direct attention to the fact that this person uh, is operating off of the assumption, or off of the conviction, might be a better word, uh, that reality is, in a certain sense, bathed in truth, or bathed in a conviction that there is such a thing as truth. Uh, we often, uh, in, a, in life experience, uh, come to see things as beautiful, as good, as true, as compelling, as, as, um, uh, as meaningful. Uh, all of these categories of meaning and truth and beauty and so on that we discover in more or less present in things around us in the world, all of that for Augustine is a way in which the world that we are experiencing now participates in a source of goodness, a source of beauty, a source of love, a source of meaning and purpose. Uh, and that, that uh, sort of uh, presupposition or that uh, orientation to reality that it is a reality that invites us to truth, to goodness, to conviction, to certainty, or to meaning, or to purpose, or to faith, or to confidence. All of that for Augustine is an underlying evidence or, or presence of this deeper dimension to reality, this, this um, more meaningful level on which to view the world. Now, having said that, uh, with respect to Augustine's general orientation to questions pertaining to God's existence, for Augustine... The supreme truth is in fact God. The supremely beautiful is God. Uh, the supreme uh, uh, meaning to all things is God. Uh, and so as we search for those things in life experience, or as we presuppose them, as we think about the world, all of that is, for Augustine, evidence of the presence of God in our thinking to begin with. So even with atheists who are searching for meaning or purpose or beauty or goodness and looking for reality at a deeper level or um, a deeper level of significance, on some level are striving after God. Uh, Augustine thinks we just need to be made more, more consciously aware of that, or perhaps we need to stop suppressing uh, those deep convictions that we have as we live our lives every day. Now, having said that, Augustine does think that we can show uh, or try to turn into a, a philosophical line of reasoning uh, some of the ways in which we can become aware of this. Uh, and let me just suggest to you one of the ways that he does this, and you can find uh, something like the reasoning that I'm sharing with you here in a book uh, that uh, Augustine wrote. It's in the form of a dialogue uh, called On the Freedom of the Will. 
and in that book at a certain point he develops the line of reasoning that I'm about to present to you. And you can also find, if you take <clears throat> this series of ideas that I'm going to present to you, you can also find texts in the Confessions of Augustine that present the same basic line of reasoning, although not quite as explicit as the way that you'll find it in the other work. <clears throat> So where do we begin? Well, for Augustine, and if you take his experience uh, as described in the Confessions, uh, this makes a little bit more sense. Augustine begins, first of all, by looking for God, by looking outside of himself. Uh, but quickly, he turns from this because he finds that the world outside of him is made up of things that are finite. They are limited. They're changeable. And so I'm not going to find God in the world outside of me uh, like I'm going to find a tree or grass or other human beings outside of me. By looking out at the world uh, that I'm experiencing, I'm seeing created things, I'm seeing finite things, and that's not what I mean by God. And so I won't find God in some type of, of crass look out at the world where I'm just looking for God as if God were another object like a tree or a stone or a, you know, a, a dog or a human being. God's a different kind of reality, and therefore you're not going to find God out there like those sorts of objects. So that's the first point, is that when I look out at the world, I don't discover God as one of the objects of the world. Uh, but what do I discover when I look at the world? Well, I find that there is a, a kind of hierarchy of things in the world outside of me. Uh, I find that as I, as I study the world, I find that there are things, some of which are non-living things, like, like dirt or uh, like rocks. Uh, those are things that are not alive, uh, but they exist. Uh, I look around more and I find things that are living. I find grass, I find trees, uh, those sorts of things. And when I contrast those two, I find that the rocks and, and the dirt are beings, they exist, and so are the, uh, the grass and the trees. Both are existing things, but the grass and the trees, they share in common existence with the rocks and the dirt, but they seem to have something more. They have the principle of life. And so at this point, Augustine would say that the world around me kind of falls into a, a bit of a hierarchy. On the bottom level, you have existing things. On the next level, you have living existing things. And he would put those higher. This is a kind of hierarchy. These are higher beings than the rocks and the dirt, the living things are, because they have what the rocks have. They have existence, but they have more than that. Uh, they have life. Furthermore, as we continue studying the world about us, we find that there are beings that are even higher than the, the grass and the trees. And those would be living things, living animals. Uh, these living things, uh, more than the, the trees and the grass, they have an awareness of their environment. They're able to move themselves about. That's the classic definition of an animal, as a being that can move itself around. Uh, presumably plants and trees and so on, they are responding to their environment. Uh, whereas the other animals, they are responding to their environment, of course, uh, but they're also able to have a measure of self-determination in response to their environment. They have instinctual powers, uh, they, they sense their environment, they run about, they're not rooted in the ground like the grass and the, the trees are. And so for Augustine, these constitute a third level, a third major level in this hierarchy that he's developing. So at the bottom, we have existing things that don't live, uh, on the second level, we have existing things that do live. Then on the third level, we have existing things that live and also have sense powers. Uh, they have instinctual powers. They have the ability to move themselves about in their environment. And sometimes they're able to even develop meaningful communal relationships, like uh, packs of wolves, for example, or, or uh, elephants or whatever. They develop certain bonds in their communities, and there's a sense of, of belonging uh, there's a greater ability, presumably, to experience pain uh, and pleasure. And so these beings have a wider range of capacities or a wider range of powers uh, that allow them to experience and to exist in a wider and uh, more broad way. Then finally, we get to the human person. And for Augustine, the human person is to be distinguished from all three of these lower levels or these, uh, hi these hierarchical levels the human person is different from those other kinds of beings. True, like the rocks and the dirt, we exist. And like the plants, we live. And like the animals, we move about and we uh, build relationships with others in our community and so on. So we are like the lower beings, uh, but we also have something that makes us even higher. 
And for Augustine, that which makes us higher is, first of all, the sense of self and the ability to to think about the things that exist on these lower levels. Like, I can have an awareness of this hierarchy, for instance. I can distinguish or, or group things into different species or different uh, genus. And uh, by putting them in these different categories, I'm developing a kind of scientific knowledge of them or a way of categorizing them uh, by seeing commonalities that exist within these objects. So I see many different types of trees, but yet I'm able to see that they share certain features in common, and therefore they are part of a class or a group of things. Same thing with various different types of animals, and we could divide them up into many different categories, of course, uh, but the point is that uh, that we as human beings have the power of doing that kind of categorization or that kind of distinction of things into different classes. The other animals and the plants and the rocks and the dirt and so on, they don't seem to have that ability. At least they don't give evidence of it. They don't get evidence of creating a kind of genus species chart or developing sciences or writing books or cataloging the various sign systems that they're able to develop like we do in the case of language. Uh, our language seems to be an infinite web of terms that we can keep creating new ones and even building on top of prior ones with imaginative entities or theoretical entities uh, and so on. We, we have this incredible, uh, almost infinite capacity of intellect to learn, to understand, to seek for understanding, to develop theories and an understanding of the world that we don't see evidenced in the other animals. The other animals seem to primarily respond to things in their environment for immediate survival or immediate pleasure and pain. Or they operate instinctually, so they might, uh, you know, store up food for winter or whatever. But it's but it's instinctually. It's not because they have developed an understanding of the world about them. They don't have to learn uh, the, about the need to store up things for the winter. Uh, they do it instinctually. Whereas in the case of human beings, we have weaker instinctual tendencies, but we have much more powerful intellectual abilities. And it's that which differentiates us from these other animals. So at this point, what Augustine has done is he's looked out at the world. And he's seen that the world outside of him is made up of these different types of beings. He puts them into a kind of hierarchy and discovers himself to be at the head of that hierarchy, at least for, for present, for the moment. Uh, the human person is at the head of this hierarchy. He is above the, the animals and the plants and the rocks and the dirt, precisely insofar as we are able to uh, exercise that power of intellect that makes us or differentiates us uh, from the other animals. So this is where we've gotten in his argument. It's first by looking outside of himself and then by turning inward within himself. And at that point, he discovers himself to be above the other things. Now what we must discover, as we continue looking at Augustine, is where does he go from there? Now that he's discovered within his own inner life, in the life of the intellect, in the life of the mind, he's discovered a reality that seems to stand above everything else in the sensory world. How do we move from this to a realization of the existence of God? Uh, so for that, we'll, we'll save for the, the next presentation to see how he makes the transition from himself as the kind of being that's able to stand above all the other beings of this world and, and intellectually know himself or something about himself and also other things in the world, whereas the other animals and other beings of this world do not have that capacity so far as we can tell. So in the next presentation, I'll try to show how he moves from this to an awareness of God.